Good afternoon everybody. How are you doing today? I hope you're well. I'm venturing back to the garden. Um, it's a week since I was lifting my onions and doing all those odd bits and bobs of jobs and wrecked me back with that stupid compost lift. It wasn't even particularly heavy, never mind. Um, kicking myself. It's one of those really stupid, annoying things because I've kind of lost a week of gardening. I've been getting on with things at home, I've been moving, I've been creating and being productive and proactive, but just not in the garden, which is where I'd rather be. So I'm venturing back today. Um, I can still feel it, so I'm going to go slowly, gently and mindfully today, see where I can get to. Um, if it looks a bit dark in here, <laughs> it's because, well, the onion rack above is full now of my onions. Can, oh, sorry, Rusty, sitting on his tail. Can you see some of the, this is the red onions, which still had a bit of greenery, but above me and all along there are the white onions, which, stop it, had lost most of their greenery. But just having those above, it stops the brightness of the white ceiling bouncing back down but also either side of me I'm surrounded by can you see um these are my bags of lavender drying and then this one this is my celery seed drying I reckon in a couple of days these will all be ready to take home for me to process strip all the little buds off the stalks talking of lavender I'm going to harvest some of mine today and just explain what I'm doing, why I'm doing it, because there are two points in the year at which you can harvest lavender. So I'll explain that once we get out there. We are definitely getting to the time of year when it's, um, it's crop and drop time. In other words, the last of some of our veggies are going over, so we get them harvested and any of the material that's left will simply be chopped up a bit and just left on the surface of the soil so that over the winter the worms can have a field day with it all. We are getting to the stage this year and it's a little bit early this year because of the drought where I'm going to be starting to be covering some beds for winter soon. Um, more of that when we come to it. The other thing I've done today is to bring this back with me. I don't know if you can see. This is a biodiversity log that all plot holders have been given on it to record plants. This isn't our vegetable plant, so it's flowers, grasses, herbs. Um, so nice long list there. Another section for insects, spiders, butterflies, moths, so, I've, for instance, I've written spiders, lots, sorry, haven't been able to identify all the different types. But yeah, a, a section for all our different insects, a section for amphibians, a section for fungi, a section for our mammals, and a section for the birds. It's a really lovely idea. Um, just before lockdown happened and we had our AGM for the year, there's a lot of talk about biodiversity, increasing it on site, all the things associated with that, with that subject. So as a starting point, let's have a survey to know what's going on in each garden. Hopefully we'll discover that actually we have got quite good diversity already. But then once we've got our survey surveys, hey buddy, <laughs> completed, then uh, or we can start to think about, you know, is there something lacking? And if there is something lacking, <laughs> I've put cats in the mammals section, of course. Yeah, if there's something lacking, what can we do? Uh, what can we do by way of introducing habitat, food source, nesting habitat, that sort of thing? What can we do to increase it? So I'm delighted that we're doing that this year and then you know come next the next AGM next spring um, we can all get together talk about what we've discovered this year and make some plans for going forward 
And what's great, Rusty, don't jump. Oh, you idiot boy. <laughs> now you're in a pickle, aren't you? You don't know where to go. Don't stand on my glasses. Don't stand on that book I brought for someone else down here. Yes, we, like I said, we already have quite a few things in place, such as we've got quite a large communal <laughs> wildlife pond. You're just showing off, aren't you, that even though you're an old boy, you can still jump really high and jump really wide. Yes, we're all very impressed, Rusty. Now, just settle down and have a sleep. So we've got our wildlife pond. We've got areas where we have our log stacks. So as those logs decay, they make great habitat for all sorts of beetles, especially stag beetles. And of course, the more insects we have in our gardens, the more there is to feed the birds. So we get hopefully more, more and varied species of birds. Oh my goodness. I think he's missed me. Have you missed me, Rusty? You're distracting though. You are very distracting. Can you hear that purr? Um, yes, so the more we can do for wildlife and biodiversity, the better. And you know, part of that is getting a natural balance so that you have that balance of sort of, you know, we've got our pests, but then we've got our predators for them. So thinking of things like toads and frogs to eat our slugs. Um, hedgehogs we don't have. Ah, oh, actually, just I'll mention that. You're actually now going to get in my lap, aren't you? Um, how did it, oh, it came out of the streaming video. So just to say very quickly about hedgehogs, it is something we looked into about, I think about two or three years ago, um, in touch with a rescue place, a hedgehog rescue place, <laughs> hares. And the problem we have here is it's not a contained garden and I think that's what they were looking for. So for instance my cousin she rescues hedgehogs or she fosters rescued hedgehogs while they're getting their weight built up and stuff but her garden is completely enclosed so not being enclosed is part of the issue but also there are still a few plot holders down here who insist on using non-organic um, pesticides, shall we say, so for instance the slug pellets, the old-fashioned slug pellets, and this is a really difficult one, isn't it, because of freedom of choice, etc, etc. I, I would love it if our society came down quite heavy on that and said, right, we're going to ban the use of these things on site from now on. Um, I know from two or three people down here that there'd be uproar if that was the case. It is a really tricky one, isn't it? Freedom of, of choice of how, how to garden. It, it, it does seem a bit arcane to me in this day and age for people to garden not organically. But that's where we're at at the moment, so for now we can't rescue any hedgehogs. Who knows, maybe one day a hedgehog will find its way this way, or two, let's face it, we want a boy and a girl, maybe they'll find their way into this site and set themselves up and start having young. That'd be great. Anyway, right, sorry, I'm digressing massively now. So today is harvest day. I'm Literally, I'm just going to do harvesting to begin with, see how my back goes. I really, really, really want to get that mulch onto the brassica beds. I think that might be pushing it, so I'm going to be sensible. I hate being sensible. Being sensible is, frankly, boring, <laughs> but I'm going to be. So, uh, let's get harvesting. I think, because it will be so gentle, let's start with the lavender. Oh my goodness, this is such a delight. Obviously I'm sitting on the path, but you can see, just look how tall it got. It's got to be over two feet tall. Okay, on with the... Oh, hello, grasshopper. I've got a grasshopper in my little basket. <laughs> leave. Yes, I shall leave her there. She'll hop out in a second. 
Right, okay, harvesting the lavender. There are, I'll show you much closer in in a second, but there are basically a couple of times a year when you can harvest. I am, <laughs> as with everything this year, a little bit late for the second harvest. Not too late. I suppose I could have done this, I could have been harvesting this through August and have it all done by the end of August. I grow my lavender obviously for me to use, but I also grow it for the bees. So, if you were a perfumera, perfume, perfumeria, perfumera, <laughs> whatever, if you're a perfume maker or uh, someone who makes essential oils, you would probably want to do the harvest at the other end of the year, just after spring when all the buds are forming. So when the buds are all there and plump, but they haven't opened yet, because at that stage, the, the oil in the flower that's making this gorgeous scent, I really wish you could smell what I'm smelling. At that stage, the, the oils, the scent, it's at its most, most concentrated. So like I said, if you're making essential oils, perfume, that's when you want it, because a little bit then goes an awfully long way. However, if you don't harvest at that stage, all is not lost because you can let them flower all summer and then harvest at the end of summer or <laughs> the beginning of autumn. <coughs> the great, <coughs> excuse me, the great thing about that, of course, is that the bees will have a field day with it all summer. And what amazed me last year, so a lavender is known to attract bees. We all know, well most of us know, that bees love lavender. I've never sort of really known of it or seen it sort of written or said anywhere that it's great for butterflies. Most of us will think of Budlia for butterflies. But last year there were days when this was covered in our beautiful peacock butterfly. The curious thing about the peacock butterfly is they go in I think it's something like a 10 year cycle. So last year was obviously year number 10 <laughs> uh, when they were all out and about and they were feasting on this lavender. So that was another reason to leave it all to them. Harvesting it now that the strength of scent is less, it is less. However, it is still really strong. <laughs> really really strong so if you are like me you're just using your lavender for craft projects for making your sachets to put in your knicker drawer to keep the moths out whatever it is then now is as good a time as any in fact i think now is the best time because we get to enjoy them all summer and the bees get to enjoy them all summer and the butterflies sometimes so when it comes to harvesting I'm literally, I will grab a clump in my hand and snip, done. As I'm doing it at this stage, <clears throat> I'm not worrying too much about the shape of what I'm leaving down there, the shape of what will then be my little bare bush. I'm just gonna get the harvest done and then later on I can come back and prune it a bit more if I want to. I might not need to. The only consideration doing it like this is don't cut too far back. You don't want to cut into your brown wood, what looks like dead wood, because otherwise the chances are you won't get any growth from that next year. And these plants, these plants should see me well for years. I think the commercial lavender growers uh, reckon to get five years out of their plants. I'm sure I read that somewhere. But for us non-commercial growers, well, who knows? Maybe I'll get ten years out of these plants. But part of that will be <laughs> caring for them and not cutting back too hard. <clears throat> I'll give you a shot of this in a second. Um, so just um, a word on sort of care, sort of planting, growing, cares, what have you. 
folk often comment on how well my lavender does here and I think people are a bit surprised because I am on quite a heavy clay soil here. The big thing I did for these plants when I planted them, <coughs> excuse me, uh, I didn't condition the soil at all in terms of any sort of manure, fertiliser, anything like that. They're actually okay with a poor soil, but what they do need is really good drainage. So throughout, actually throughout the whole of this end of the bed, I dug in a load of grit through the whole bed because I knew this was going to be my sort of dry Mediterranean herbs end. At the top end where I've got things like Lovage and Sweet Sicily, I didn't put grit in there and they did get a bit of manure up there because those much fleshier green herbs, if you like, they do like a bit of that. When I came to planting, the, for each planting hole I made a decent sized hole and in the bottom a layer probably about two maybe even three inches deep of pure grit and that's what their roots went and sat on to and I think I think that's what's made them so happy here uh, the other thing to say obviously we're in this drought year so we've we've, we've talked about this quite a bit this year <laughs> too much um, I don't water the herb bed it's it gets left completely on its own apart from the little bergamot, which is still struggling, it's not really doing anything, I have watered. And right at the top end, up there, I've watered the lovage a bit, because again, it's, it's a more sort of green, fleshy herb, if you like. But otherwise, the lavender, hyssop, chamomile, none of it gets a single drop of water. I suppose I've sort of inadvertently created my own Beth Chateau drought gravel garden whatever but you know everything in here seems to it all seems to be happy everything seems to be really thriving so as my granddad would say <coughs> I've just <coughs> breathed in a bit of flour <coughs> as my granddad would say if it ain't broke don't fix it okay let me show you a little bit more closely how I'm harvesting this and pruning my little lavender domes so literally all I do is I grab a chunk of them and then can you see here the much sort of paler, um, the sort of, it's almost grey isn't it, growth there. That's what I'm mindful, I don't want to cut beyond that because that's all of next year's growth for me. So a handful, literally just snip it out pop it to one side and then I don't know if you can make it out but you can see the stalks of this year's harvest are protruding somewhat so all I will do <coughs> is might do this another day because it does take a while but I can just clip it all back hopefully you can see this so I'm just clipping all of these back to where I can see that pale, like I say, almost grey growth. You don't have to do this. It's just, well, I think it looks a bit tidier. <laughs> you know me, I like my tidy garden. And the aim then is I'll have my nice little dome shape again, all ready for growing next year. I tell you what though, it does take a little while to get it all done. As I was mentioning the other day, I went into Gary's garden to harvest his. He's very kindly let me have his entire harvest, which I've shared a little bit with other pot neighbours already. But um, you can see now why it took me, <laughs> oh, two hours. Beautiful. Mm but it's such a pleasure and actually with a slightly with a slightly angry back um, it's a gentle job to do with a little bit of movement as I sort of stretch in and out of bed that's a nice little bit of a stretch oops
heaven sent. One bush done, five more to go. Need to go and empty my basket. Such a lovely sight and lovely smell. Oh, isn't that gorgeous? Oh, we're deep in shadow here. We're always deep in shadow here, aren't we? And now, quite simply, so that's the first bush. I reckon this will now get divided into about, about five bunches, which I will quite simply hang upside down in a brown paper bag to dry. The reason I put them in the bag, oh let's sit down a second, noisy crinkly for a minute. I don't know what was in that last year but there was a little bit of something left. So yeah, into, let me just get a nice bunch, a little bit more. Bunch about yay big. So if you look, you sort of see how many stalks there are. This amount into the bag will mean there's space for drying. I don't want to cram the bag absolutely full um, because I want there to be air movement in there. I don't want them all squished together where they'll sweat and possibly rot. But yeah, what I think is the reason I do it in the bags rather than, look, it would be much, much prettier in the shed for me to tie these small bunches, especially if I got them all to the same sort of lengths, tie them all up and hang them from my drying rack. It would look so pretty, of course it would, but I'd lose some of the harvest and for me literally everything that comes out of the garden is precious so by doing it in the paper bags it just means that as it's drying any of these blossoms that drop off I catch them in the bottom of the bag and you'd be amazed you know even in sort of two three weeks time after they've had two or three weeks of drying in the shed you'd be amazed how much blossom has dropped and is in the bottom of those bags don't want to waste any of it and the other thing of course to remember is I'll then transport these home um, where I will process them as in taking all the buds off the stalks before uh, getting ready to turn them into gorgeous lavender bags I've got some beautiful fabrics some more Liberty fabrics yeah so to transport them home like this I'm not gonna lose any fab stuff so they'll have, like I say, about two or three weeks to dry in the shed. We are really warm at the moment and dry, so that should be enough. If when I come to take them home and I'm and I'm um, processing them, if I feel like, oh, I think there might be a little bit of moisture in there still, I'll take the blossoms off. I'll just spread them all out on trays to have a final thorough dry in my south-facing window. Right, that's one plant done. I was thinking about doing all the rest of them right now, but actually there's a harvest I want to get in now that I want to get in even more than the lavender because if I don't do the lavender today, if I do it in a week, it will be fine. Whereas the other thing I want to harvest, there's a chance I'll lose it if I don't do it today. Come on, let's go and get a trog and a barrow. So the harvest I'm really keen to get in now, the chickpeas. I've only done half a bed this year compared to the whole bed, so they're even more precious. Half a bed because, well, I sowed them when I was at the stage when I thought I was going to have to leave half the garden covered. Never mind. The reason for harvesting now is to try and beat the mice to them this year. So. You can harvest them green or brown, it doesn't matter. The green ones are gorgeous, they're a gorgeous snack. If they're green, eat them now, snack on them or freeze them. 
the brown ones, of course, will, will go in for dry storage. What I found over the years, the, oh, missed, hold on a sec. Oh, my back's still a bit naughty. The easiest way to harvest, take a couple of branches and, oops, that one's already coming off. Can you hear that? They're dry. And then literally just run your fingers down it. A couple have just dropped off, popped off. I will go through these in a minute, scour the ground for them. So I'm going to have green and brown mixed in here. It doesn't matter because literally this evening or an evening I will be sitting podding the lot. If they're green they'll go in one bowl, if they're brown a different bowl. With all this foliage, I'm just popping it in the barrow for now because I want to get all the plants out harvested. Then it'll give me a chance to look over the floor for any that I've dropped. Once I've done that, whoopla, don't want to miss any. I can get this foliage, get it chopped up and put it straight back on this bed, as I was saying in the shed, to start as my winter covering. Though having said that, I've got a couple of spare brassicas, amazingly. So I'm thinking about bunging them in here. Might as well, eh? I mean, they're pathetic looking, really pathetic looking, but you never know. They may come to something. Oh, back. <laughs> lovely Hi. I'm all right let me just turn okay let's see if I can show you this a bit more closely you can tell <laughs> I love that sound that this is quite dry <laughs> let's just make it into two halves it's a bit more manageable and then yeah just finger and thumb down the stem rub them off <laughs> I'm happy to hear the rattle because it means there's beans in there, peas in there. Yay! They are a real fiddle to pod. I know I've said that already. I'll say it until the day I die, probably. So when you come to podding, I suggest maybe you put a good film on Good radio play on, sit with friends to do it, because they are tedious, and they take ages, but my goodness, treasure like this, so worth it, so worth it, and it looks, it looks like I might have beaten the Mises to it this year, woohoo! Oh. Halfway there, another happy, happy sight. If you have tried chickpeas for the first time this year or you're thinking of trying them for the first time next year, a couple of things I will say. One, they are a dead easy plant to grow. Literally, you put the seed in the ground, leave them alone, leave them alone the whole season, harvest. Obviously water them. Um, and the only issues sometimes is germination issues, but just put two in each hole. So yeah, dead, dead, dead easy plant to grow. Ridiculously easy. Harvesting and processing, different story. Harvesting, harvesting them dry is much easier than harvesting them green. Because when they're dry and they've dropped some of their foliage, that moment of getting the pods off the stalk is dead easy. When they're green, it's a bit it is more fiddly and so I've got a few leaves in here so it's easier dry also processing it's easier to actually pod them so here's a fairly dry one podding them dry 
you hear that? They pop open and then, oh, it's a tour. And then you reveal your lovely little peas inside. With the green ones, they don't pop. So you have to kind of gouge them out. I think it's worth it because they're gorgeous. I think in particular they're beautiful to have green and green we don't see them in the shops so how else are you going to eat green chickpeas unless you grow them in terms of calories in calories out well like I'm saying as in terms of growing them dead easy no work at all harvesting and processing a chunk of work but if you're doing it whilst you're doing something else uh, it's neither here nor there is it in terms of yield per square meter of my garden there are probably things i could grow that i could get a higher yield from for instance the tomatoes but you know i've got plenty of space for tomatoes so i wouldn't grow more tomatoes in place of chickpeas other beans in place of them could do um well they are i could I could do another type of bush bean maybe. It's one of those you have to weigh up for yourself. For me, it's a bit of a, it's a luxury crop, if you like, when so much else of the garden is all about the yield, get the highest yield I possibly can. This is one of those that I grow, it's a treat. It's a treat, so I don't worry too much about that yield per square metre. I love them. My back's a bit cronky again, so I think I'm going to sit here and <laughs> let me show you a green one. That's so fiddly. It almost looks like a little miniature Brussels sprout. You see, oh, it looks like a bottom, <laughs> a little green bottom. Gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. Yeah, so I think probably what I'm going to do. I'm just going to have a little rest for a minute. I can start sorting, getting some of the leafage out. I'm not going to do the processing here. I'll take them home. I'll do that this evening, probably whilst I'm chatting on a Skype call, something like that. Fab. For now, though, I'm going to say cheerio to you all. Mm. That really is a ha Oop. <laughs> happy sight, isn't it? Yeah, cheerio to you all. I hope you're enjoying your harvests, whatever you're harvesting at the moment. I know a lot of us are beginning to start to think about winding the garden down a bit. I know some of you have already had frost in other parts of the world, good grief. For some of you, the garden has finished already. For those of us in a mild, temperate climate who can garden all year, make the most of it, enjoy every single day even the autumn jobs. See you again soon. Bye for now. Mm.